As we talk about this subject this morning, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to have a, a little extended reading on this subject, and then we'll, we'll look at the subject of atonement. Read with me in Hebrews 9, beginning in verse 18. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For, for when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all of the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water in scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often, as the high priest enters the holy place year after year, with the blood that is not his own. That's from the book of Hebrews. We want to talk a little bit about the implications of what it says there, but I want to start by asking you a, a question. Are you in debt? Or have you ever been in debt? And I don't mean just owe oh, a little bit of money. I mean, have you been in debt up to here? Have you been over your head in debt? Just by asking that question, I know that some in our viewing audience are feeling some anguish about that. I, I know that there are some people who watch our program who are in debt over their head. There are some who are likely on the verge of bankruptcy as a result of their debt. So you, you know what I'm talking about. Debt is, is crushing. When you owe money that you cannot pay, when you look at all of that debt that is accumulated on your credit cards, there's a great deal of frustration and anxiety and worry and pressure. I want to use that illustration to talk about a different kind of debt. We're not talking about in this lesson physical indebtedness. We're talking about spiritual indebtedness. If you've ever been in debt, though, you will truly appreciate what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about the word atonement. I want us to examine the word atonement together, to pay a debt for one who is unable to pay. Atonement may sound like one of those preacher-type words. Maybe you've heard it when you've uh, been in a Bible study or a church. Maybe at one time you knew what it means. Maybe you know what it means. But for a lot of people, atonement is one of those mystical Bible words. Just exactly what does it mean? It's, it's a great word for us to understand. And it's, a word that, uh, it's a word that we ought to appreciate. You can look it up in the dictionary, and you will find that its secular definition is this, to supply a need. Some dictionary definitions will also say to restore a deficiency. Interestingly enough, in the Greek, the Greek is the language that was used to reveal the New Testament, as you know, it literally means to pay a debt, and particularly to pay a debt that an individual was unable to pay. That's what it means. It, it had to do with banking and finances and money. And that's the reason for 
me asking you if you'd ever been in debt, if you knew what that felt like, if you understood what that was all about. Let me begin then by reminding you of, of this fact. When, when God creates us, He creates us in His own image. Genesis 1 and verse 27 says. And when He does that, He creates every one of us holy and without sin. I know you've been exposed to the idea in, in the religious world that we come into this world with sin. That's not a concept that is taught by the Scriptures. It is a concept that is taught by men. But being part of the image of God means that we come in into this world without sin at all. We're, we're pure and free from sin. In Luke 18, Jesus said, Let the little children come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, they, they were not sinners. They were innocent. They were pure. They were without sin. And that's the way that God makes us. But when we, when we grow older, as we begin to age and mature, one at a time, we all choose sin. And at this point, we've got to understand what that means, really. Sin is a word, a Bible word, that literally means to miss the mark. And when it comes to our relationship to God, it means that we do not meet His ideal for us. Sin, when applied to the archer, meant that the archer just didn't hit the bullseye. He didn't hit the spot. When it's applied to us in our relationship to God, it has to do with not meeting God's ideal. We miss the mark of God's ideal for our lives. And when we do that, we are guilty of sin. And much like the self-righteous Pharisee who invited Jesus to come to his house, when he looked at other people who were notorious sinners, he compared himself to the sinful woman, and he thought to himself that he wasn't really all that bad. When we, when we talk about sin today, we tend to think about bad sins as, and, uh, as the sins that are committed by the criminals and by others. Those are the really bad things that we can understand would cause a separation between uh, man and God. But I, I want you to understand this. When I do not meet God's ideal in my life, I sin. It is not necessarily a criminal act. It may simply be something I refuse to do, I overlook doing, I neglect to do. It may be something I dwell upon that I shouldn't dwell upon. Anytime, anytime, I miss God's ideal, I sin. Whatever I do, I need to make that right with God. And whenever I do something wrong, I've sinned. Paul, when he writes to the Romans in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Everyone has my sin misses the mark. And when that happens, then I begin to incur a debt to my Creator. He, he gave me sinlessness in my relationship to Him. I'm pure and free from sin, and then I begin to add a debt. My sins begin to stack up, and that debt begins to grow and to grow and to grow. I want to talk about how we can resolve that problem when we come back in just a minute. So because of our sin, we begin to build up this debt. And the problem uh, is uh, th there's nobody that can help me with that, that debt. I can't go to you 
and uh, you you don't have a storehouse of righteousness built up that you can help me take care of this debt of sin. N no man or, or woman is any better than any other man or woman. Paul said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means that I can't go to you and get a loan for my spiritual indebtedness. Puts me in a very bad situation. Puts you in a very bad situation. Collectively, we're no better off than we are individually. We all have this huge problem with sin. And Paul said in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. The idea of the wage here is something uh, that is payback that's coming our way. It's what I, I get in turn for my sin. It's not physical death that he's talking about, although physical death is certainly a consequence of our sin. It's spiritual death. It's separation. Take a look at this slide. This really helps to illustrate it. Isaiah says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. You see, that mounting debt of sin creates a division between us and God. God made me perfect without sin. I separated myself from him when I sin. And uh, that's very much like the relationship that you would have to your banker if you refuse to pay your indebtedness. You know what happens when you default on your loan, don't you? There's a separation. Um, you go to the bank and you ask them for a loan and they're if you can absolute, absolutely, positively demonstrate that, that you don't need the money, they'll be happy to loan it to you. But if you, if you ever default on that, your relationship to the banker is terminated. They no longer deal with you the same way that they did before. Atonement is all about that kind of a relationship when it comes to sin. You keep accumulating a debt that you cannot pay. What do I do? This debt is much more serious than, than a financial debt. The good news is God gave us an answer. God takes care of that debt. And I want to illustrate that by going over to Leviticus chapter 17. I want you to see this in Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement this is one of the fundamental principles that God has established in his word that that we need to be able to to see we, we may not be able to understand why God cho chose to do it this way or the reasoning behind it, but God in his infinite wisdom has decreed this. He said, look, you humans are accumulating this humongous debt of sin, and sin is sapping the life out of you, the spiritual life. Sin is taking that spiritual life away from you. And that sin is creating such a debt that is drawing you away from your father. And since your life is dependent upon blood, I'm going to use blood to illustrate this to you. The life is in the blood. Now, let me stop right here and say this is also true as you carry this over into the New Testament. The life is in the blood, in the blood of Christ. Christ is the one who offering his blood brings us spiritual life. There's something also interesting to notice in Leviticus 17 and verse 11, and that's the truth of this statement even from a physical standpoint that has only recently be, been discovered in the medical world. 
doctors now know that in order for physical life to be sustained, you, you got to take a look at the blood and what's happening with the blood. And if there's a problem with the blood, that's going to uh, inhibit or enhance, that's going to inhibit, if there's a problem with it, the physical life. If, if you take the blood out of, a, out of a human being, he's dead. Ask George Washington if you want to know about that, who was bled to death by his doctors. You see, we, we see this physical principle existing in the world, and it's a physical principle, like many things in the physical world, that is to illustrate for us a spiritual truth. The life is in the blood. The life is in the blood of Christ. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. There has to be a life that pays for sin, life that pays for death. And so Israel, knowing that this growing chasm of sin was mounting a debt that they could not pay, were instructed by God to have a day of atonement. That would be one day every year in which their sins would be completely forgiven. Leviticus 16 verse 11 says this, Then Aaron shall offer the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his household. And he shall slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. Aaron would do this. He would take a bull and he would slit its throat and take that blood and he would spread it out on the altar. He would go into the holy of holies. You see in our, our artist depiction of what the holy of holies looked like and the blood of the covenant which Aaron is holding in the bowl and he's standing right now before the ark of the covenant. This is very accurate. The artist's depiction is very accurate according to what Leviticus tells us. He takes one finger and he dips it in that blood and he throws it all over the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant is said to be the mercy seat, the propitiation, the place that shields us from our sin. God decreed that this shedding of blood would bring about atonement. You can pay for your sin through blood. And so, in, so Aaron did that every year on the Day of Atonement until he died. And priests did that for generation after generation after generation after generation. But now there comes a problem. The people who were offering those animal sacrifices and that animal blood and being obedient to God knew and God knew that that animal blood was not taking away the sins of the humans' sins. It was a substitute for a sacrifice that was to come in the future. Look at this passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 10. Now the law, since it is, it only has a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year after year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would, have not, they would not cease to have been offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away the sins. You see, that's what Aaron and the children of, uh, of Israel understood. When we come back in just a minute, I want to take you to another passage that helps to explain this. Let's go back to Hebrews and look at another passage in Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 23. Therefore, it was necessary 
for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. See, the point that the Hebrew writer is making is that in the Old Testament, God allowed a substitute, the blood of bulls and goats. He promised them if they were obedient to him through the offering of this blood that they would receive forgiveness and they receive forgiveness from God based upon the fact that Christ was coming and that he would pay the penalty. When he talks about the holy place made with hands, Christ entered the holy place, the spiritual holy place, the spiritual realm, the church, and, and God's rule in men's hearts when he offered himself as a sacrifice for sins. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, the apostle John said, when he saw Jesus coming, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And then he wrote in 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2, My little children, I'm writing you these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. You see, Jesus is the solution to that sin problem. It's interesting that John says, I'm writing to you that you may not sin, but if you sin, here is the, here's the answer. Here is the solution to that sin problem. In John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, John says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, the Scripture tells us that He, the Word who became flesh, led, led, a, led a, sinful, a, a sinless life. We do not have one who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was faithful to God in all things. He then, because he led a sinful, a sinless life, is able to pay for those who lived a sinful life. He pays that debt. He paid a debt that he did not owe. I'm the recipient of him paying that debt off. That's what, that's what atonement means. In my life, on one occasion, I owed a lot of money. Someone stepped in to help me pay that debt. In my spiritual life, I owed a debt to God, and God paid that debt in Christ. John Bunyan wrote, in the 17th century, one of the most famous works of all called Pilgrim, Pilgrim's Progress. The main character in Pilgrim's, Pilgrim's Progress is a character named Christian. Here's what Bunyan wrote. Now I saw in my dream that the highway up Christian was to go was fenced on either side by a wall. And that wall was called salvation. Up this way, therefore, did burden Christian run, but not without great difficulty because of the load that was on his back. He ran thus until he came to a place somewhat ascending, and upon that place stood a cross, and a little below in the bottom a sepulcher. So I saw in my dream that just as Christian came up with the cross, his burden loosened from his shoulders and he fell and it fell from his back and began to tumble and so continued to do so until it came to the mouth of the sepulchre where it fell in and I saw it no more Bunyan was writing about the truth of what we're talking about in atonement our burdens are released 
in Christ. We are atoned from that debt sin because of the blood of Christ. We'll see you again next week on What Do the Scriptures Say? I hope you'll tune in for another great study in the parables or one of these great Bible words. See you then. Bye-bye. We thank you for your interest in What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that you will come back to ScripturesSay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.